Uh, guys from, from the organizing committee asked me to speak in English because we have one of the guests. Second one, I asked them for how long it should take. This, this, uh, how, for how long this talk should take. And uh, the, the friend of mine who is a GI surgeon told me that it should take like two hours because we have to be in balance with the guys from Coloportology. Since only Professor Karachun and I will talk today about something else but the colorectal surgery, it should take two hours, but it will not take two hours, don't worry. Before I start the talk, I would like to invite you to, to come for the, for us, very important meeting. It's the second Congress of Serbian Association of Endoscopic Surgeons that will take place in Belgrade between 14th and 16th November this year. Well, we are all, you're all warm welcome to join us. Uh, despite rising awareness, uh, most of the patients with, present, uh, with esophageal cancer present with local advanced disease where surgical treatment as a solo treatment option is associated with poor survival. Uh, distant micrometastasis and unresected local disease are to be blamed for the recurrence of the disease. So, multi-modality treatment options dating back in, in, 2000, uh, in 1980s uh, were introduced to facilitate local control of the, of the disease and, and chance survival. Magic trial, famous magic trial published by David Cunningham and, and co-workers back in 2006 in New England Journal of Medicine was foundation of perioperative chemotherapy concept. They offered preoperative three cycles of uh, platinum-based triplet before surgery, then surgery, then three cycles of platinum-based triplet after surgery, and they showed that survival is significantly better compared to surgery alone. Due to sample size and rigorous design of the trial, magic trial concept means perioperative chemotherapy became one standard of care for patients with locally advanced esophageal adenocarcinoma and GA junction uh, cancer for, uh, in Europe and to some extent in the United States. And indeed, Magic Trial launched uh, platinum-based triplet as one standard of care, but most recently, that's what Excel-based triplet uh, promoted in the FLOT trial, showed safety and efficacy to treat, to treat patients with GA junction and distal esophageal adenocarcinoma. As a matter of fact, in, in a trial published this year, mean survival after ECF or ECX was 35 months, and with FLOT trial concept, uh, it was 15 months, which means that for the past two years, FLOT trial concept <coughs> is one standard of care, is a treatment of care, at least in Europe. An issue with triplet chemo is that it's too systemic, it means that uh, toxicity of grade three or four significantly reduced delivery rate of, of therapy, and especially in patients with poor performance status. Chemo radiation concept was designed to be less systemic. The foundation of chemo radiation concept was famous CRUSS study published back in 2012, again, New England Journal of Medicine. And the, the overall conclusion of the trial was that survival and local control of the disease is significantly better after chemo radiation compared to surgery alone. But CROSS study was predominantly a study based on patients with esophageal squamous cell carcinoma. When you, when you do the pooled hazard ratio for, for patients with esophageal carcinoma, adenocarcinoma, the survival difference is at the borderline of statistical significance. At the moment, we don't know is it better to use perioperative chemo or preoperative chemo radiation. Maybe a solution to that tough question could be to wait and see the results of randomized controlled trials. And there are three, at least three randomized controlled trials running at the moment. And uh, we are sincerely hope that some of these trials will resolve this very important dilemma. Meanwhile, since the fact that some of the patients will be poor 
uh, guys poor uh, with with the uh, with the treatment response. Uh, the question was: Is there a chance to predict these poor treatment responders? And groups from Technical University in Munich first used PET CT scan to uh, detect early treatment response. They analyzed delta SUV means decline of SUV uh, between two uh, examinations, one performed before surgery, uh, before chemotherapy, and the other two weeks after cessation of, of, of chemotherapy. And they identified 35% uh, of delta SUV as a cutoff value between good responders and bad responders. Florian Lordig from the same institution took a step forward he offered an option for these bad, poor responders to stop chemotherapy and send, them, send this guy directly to surgery. And with this concept, he increased two-year median survival rate in non-responders from 18 to 26 months. And Karen Goodman from University of Colorado uh, offered another trial design. She started a randomized trial with crossover design. She offered two chemotherapy regimens, two different chemotherapy regimens, an option, an option to, to switch from, to crossover from one chemotherapy regimen to another in the case of bad treatment response after two weeks. Preliminary results were published at the ESCO meeting last year, and they were favorable. Will this affect overall survival? At the moment, we don't know. We have to wait and see them and results of the trial. Due to the fact that correlation between clinical and pathological treatment responses in, in esophageal adenocarcinoma is poor, <coughs> surgery will continue to be a cornerstone of multimodality treatment for esophageal and J-junction adenocarcinoma. Brandon Stiles and, and group from Will Cornell Medicine presented interesting paper last year at the meeting of American Society for Cardiothoracic Surgery. They queried American cancer database from the period between 2004 and 2014 for patients with esophageal cancer, and they identified 18,000 patients with esophageal cancer. Out of 18,000 patients, they identified 700 of these who refused surgical treatment when it was advocated. And the conclusion of the trial was that patients with esophageal cancer who refuse surgery when it is recommended are less likely to survive long term than similar group of patients who underwent an operation. And overall survival benefit was 12% at five years. When it comes to surgical treatment, Many dilemmas have already, been built, uh, have already been solved, but some are still a matter of debate, like what's the proper extent of lymph node dissection, where to do esophagastric anastomosis, and how to do it. At the end of the day, is it better to use open or minimally invasive approach? Well, From January 2018, last, from the last revision of, of the classification of the tumors uh, made by European, by the, the uh, United Union against cancer, not only distal esophageal cancer, zero type one cancer, but junction type of cancer means zero type two cancer should be diagnosed and treated as esophageal cancer. When we're talking about GA junction cancer, there is no dilemma. Both guidelines from Far East and, and West uh, claim together that two field lymph node dissection is or should be a standard of care. But when we look at the distal esophageal cancer, there are disagreements. When we look at the Western treatment guidelines, we can find that two field lymph node dissection should be standard of care. But when we look at the Japanese esophageal cancer treatment guideline, we can find that they claim that three-field lymph node dissection should be a standard of care. Well, we know that Japanese treatment guidelines are based on 
uh, patients with squamous cell carcinoma predominantly. We know that genetic footprint of esophageal adenocarcinoma and squamous cell carcinoma are quite different. But we don't know is there a difference in prevalence of lymph node metastasis between squamous cell ca cancer and adenocarcinoma. At the end of the day, we don't know is there a difference in the localization of positive lymph nodes in, between patients with, with squamous, squamous cell carcinoma and adenocarcinoma. <clears throat> At our department, for both GI junction cancer and distal esophageal adenocarcinoma, two field lymph node dissection is standard of care, means dissection of lymph nodes in the belly, around the celiac trunk and in the chest uh, and the top level of lymph node dissection in the chest is tracheal bifurcation. When you look at the results from a uh, big group uh, who published paper in disease of the Yellow Zophobus 2017, it's uh, paper supported by uh, disease uh, by the International Society for Disease of Esophagus, we can find that more than 95% of surgeons in Europe and North America, and at least more than 50% of surgeons in Asia perform two-field lymph node dissection, not only for J-junction cancer, but for distal esophageal adenocarcinoma as well. What about esophagastric anastomosis? Well, we can find that this anastomosis can be performed in the neck or in the chest. Proponents of the neck anastomosis claim that it's safe, means that even in the case of leakage, uh, it should be a local issue. But to be honest, leakage of the intrathoracic anastomosis is not as prevalent as was 20 years ago. In addition, treatment of, of leakage is way better than it was 10 or 20 years ago. <coughs> At the end of the day, proponents of the neck anastomosis are not really ready to admit what's the real prevalence of leakage in the neck. The general trend is that anastomosis is moving into the chest. What about a specific technique how to perform esophageal gastric anastomosis? Well, we can find in the literature and, and, and in the real life many different techniques. It can be hand sewn, it, it can be performed using a linear stapler, circular stapler, and every single technique has many variations. At the moment, we don't know which technique is associated with the best patient outcomes. We started with uh, the anastomosis, like you, you're able to see in this short video. We use per string staple of anastomosis in the first 20 cases. It's a similar technique that we use in, in open chest case. Not difficult, but meanwhile we move to the double staple of anastomosis, not the oral type of anastomosis, but reversal penetrating technique with ancillary troca. Means that after we open the esophagus way above the tumor, we introduced and then into the, into the esophagus, then take the ancillary trocar out through the anterior wall of the esophagus at the level where the anastomosis is supposed to be. Then we cut or transect the esophagus close to the ancillary trocar, as close as possible. Then we introduce the stapler into the gastric conduit, pull it up, connect anvil with stapler, approximate the tissue and fire the stapler. To our point of view it's way easier than using a per string, per string stitch. But I truly believe that there is no one technique that will fit all patients. In older patients or in the patients after chemo radiation where the esophagus is not wide enough to introduce 25 stapler, we perform side-to-side -side 
uh, state of the Nesna Moses with suturing, it's a ringer style. First step is to align esophagus with gastric conduit, then transect the esophagus, make an opening in gastro gastric conduit, then we put two traction stitches. And with the help of traction stitches, with the aid of traction stitches, we introduce endoscopic linear stapler and create side to side esophagastric anastomosis. Of course, there is a big opening after the side to side is off of gastric anastomosis. Before we close the opening, we have to check staple line for bleeding. And then we use one or two layers of running stitch to, to close the, the, the opening. The advantage of, of this kind of anastomosis over the hands-on anastomosis is that first of all staple line is releasing attraction and then it's the anastomosis is much wider than what than when it's hands-on. Well Again, at the moment, we don't know which technique is associated with most optimal treatment outcomes, but, but last year, during the 2018, there was an international audit on esophagastric anastomosis. It was coordinated by the West Midland Research Collaborative. In the international audit, more than 100 units were included across more than 40 countries, and 2,257 patients recorded records were submitted. When we analyze the data of, of this international audit, we can find that if the decision on, on how to make an anastomosis is not financially driven, in most cases, an anastomosis was performed with stapler. And when we look at the high volume centers in high income countries, we can find that only 4% of centers use hands-on anastomosis and vast majority use circular stapler to create anastomosis. At the very end, I truly believe that, personally believe that, that circular anastomosis, circular stapled anastomosis is the best at the moment, but again, there is no single technique that fits all patients. Uh, we have to adjust technique and even use some other option in the patients with specific needs. Mean, means that in high volume centers, surgeons have to be aware of all technique how to create sufficient, how to create the best possible anastomosis. At the end of the day, is it better to use open or minimal invasive approach? I think that that's a rhetorical question because we here all agree about the value of minimal invasive surgery. Nevertheless, uh, under the term MIE, minimal invasive esophagectomy, you can find many different procedures. Total minimal invasive esophagectomy, hybrid procedure, robotic assisted, laparoscopic assisted, video assisted, media stenoscopic, and many others. We started with hybrid minimal invasive esophagectomy back in 2009, and in 2014 we shift toward total minimally invasive esophagectomy. When we finished the hybrid procedure, we collected the data and published a paper in European Journal of Surgical Oncology. The dilemma was, could hybrid minimally invasive esophagectomy fulfill expectations of minimally invasive approach and improve treatment results of esophageal cancer? And the conclusion of paper was that 
minimal invasive esophagectomy is a big step from open to total minimal invasive esophagectomy, but at the end of the day, just a step. There is increasing number of trials comparing open and minimal invasive esophagectomy, at least five well-designed randomized controlled trials, one phase two multicentric trial from the United States, increasing number of meta-analyses. First trials were designed as non-inferiority trials, means to try to prove that MAE is not inferior to open surgery, but not anymore. One of the most recent published meta-analyses, one published in Oncotarget Therapy 2016, concluded that MAE is a better choice for esophageal cancer because patients undergoing MAE may benefit from reduced blood loss, less respiratory complications, and also, for the first time, improved overall survival compared to open esophagectomy. Minimal invasive esophagectomy has intuitive attraction between patients and between surgeons. When we look at the data from the disease of the esophagus 2017, we can find that in 2007, only 20% of surgeons in Europe and North America implemented minimal invasive approach to treat esophageal cancer, but the seven years later, 2014, 50%, one out of two surgeons and one of the two units, surgical units, performed minimally, some kind of minimally invasive approach. 2013, Anosur Surgical Oncology, Lawrence Lee and group from Canada, from University of Montreal, they compared cost and effectiveness of open and minimal invasive esophagectomy and concluded that MAE is, is cost effective compared to open esophagectomy in patients with resectable esophageal cancer. Well, what about ERES protocol? Well, it's a protocol designed to uh, decrease number of complications, especially non-surgical complications, to decrease survival, uh, to decrease hospital stays, sorry, and to increase patient satisfaction. It was introduced in many types of, of surgery, including esophageal cancer surgery. I truly believe that minimally invasive surgery is some stone, it's, it's a central part of, of ERES protocol, but at the end of the day, it's just one piece of a puzzle. It's just, just one part of multidisciplinary protocol that should be standard of care in modern centers, high volume centers for esophageal cancer surgery. In conclusion, most of the patients present with locally advanced disease and uh, before surgery, they should have some kind of induction therapy. Is it FLOT or MAGIC? Means perioperative chemotherapy or chemoradiation before surgery. At the moment, we don't know. But we know that MA is superior to open esophagectomy to treat esophageal cancer. We know that uh, most centers in, in Europe and North America perform two fields lymph node dissection, exactly two field standard lymph node dissection, and there is general trend moving anastomosis into the chest. And more and more surgeons from high volume centers perform uh, minimally invasive esophagectomy as a part of ERES protocol. What's the five-year view? Well, out of 12 FDA approved Treatment option, non surgical treatment options for esophageal adenocarcinoma. At least 50% of them have biomarkers associated uh, with good treatment response or treatment ineffectiveness. At the moment, only HER2 testing is in regular clinical use. Uh, unfortunately, HER2 positivity could be expected in about 20 to 25 percent of patients with esophageal NGH junction adenocarcinoma. Use of transtuzumab is standard of care in Europe for uh, patients with metastatic HER2 positive esophageal and G junction adenocarcinoma. There is ongoing trial, innovation trial, that is. Uh, 
trial uh, that is that supposed to analyze the efficacy of use of trastuzumab in HER2 positive patients before surgical intervention in an adjuvant setting, and we are waiting for the results of that trial. Uh, there is one more option ahead of us. PDL1 is presented is overexpressed in 40% with distal esophageal and GA junction adenocarcinoma. PDL1 is harnessing the immune system to fight against tumor. Use of medications that will block PDL1 and simultaneous use of immunotherapy could pack punch power enough to fight against esophageal adenocarcinoma, but, but to be used in an adjuvant setting. It should be used first and show efficacy in the treatment of metastatic disease. What about five-year view in, in, in surgery? Well, we heard a lot about robotic surgery. The, the, the biggest issue is uh, cost-effectiveness. It's not cost-effective to laparoscopic surgery. At least five or six new systems will be available in the years to come. The expectation is that price that the, will go down and if the if it, the price go down goes down then we'll probably move from minimal invasive surgery in, in, uh, laparoscopic and thoracoscopic minimally invasive surgery in the new era of robotic assisted minimally invasive surgery thank you Sledeći, sledeći predavanje, e, to je doktor Milenik Pečeranić, Rapors, Vapor, sve projekat, odnosno sve ovakvim projekat za povezaj, aparaskopiju u Srbiji.